uh, also comments that uh, suggest sexual advances or uh, propositions and things like leering or the way that you look at somebody. I've had a bit of information here about the context around sexual harassment, and that's because if you're new to learning about this topic, and most of us here probably aren't, but if you read in the media, we often hear about the same kind of case over and over again, and that is that the media typically reports on stereotypical or classic forms of sexual harassment in the workplace only. And I put a few quotes here from a, um, a, an article that talk about what that might look like. For example, a high-profile male who's alleged to have found or harassed a subordinate female. They typically include uh, scandalous allegations or overtly sexual conduct. So, uh, you know, you can think of what you hear about in uh, the media and news reports that often talk about this one again problem uh, employee who is creating problems for subordinate staff. And again, I will say, while this can oftentimes be the case, um, this is a very narrow scope of what sexual harassment can look like. And so it's important to talk about those traditional or classical. Um, uh, context that we more likely hear about, um, so it can open our eyes to the continuum of what sexual harassment in a workplace will look like. Some common misconceptions that sexual harassment is only a situation of odd or bold sexual behavior, sometimes called sexual misconduct, which suggests that that individual is doing something that's just inappropriate, uh, where it might be appropriate in another situation. Another common misconception is that sexual harassment is about unrequited attraction. So for example, that um, I like somebody and I want to date them and I'm trying to get their attention and uh, I'm persistent about it. Another common misconception is that sexual harassment is largely about sexual desire. So that one person is just so attracted to somebody um, that they continue to uh, persist and harass them. And these, of course, are misconceptions. On the contrary, patterns of sexual harassment often um, can be cases of one individual to another, but they usually reflect cultural or workplace norms. And that might mean uh, whose turf or space that is. And by turf, I mean space and whose space. So when we think about sexual harassment, often harassment is connected to who believes they belong in that workplace or the, in that employee position, or in that warehouse, building, cubicle, or other workspace. Ideally, each employee believes that everyone belongs, but oftentimes that is not the message or workplace, that is not the message a workplace or its practices are sending. And because of this, it may lay a foundation where some employees feel that the space is theirs only. So for example, I was recently in Sarnia, Ontario, where the Sexual Assault Center shared results of a community-based needs assessment. What their survey found was that for older women in this rural rural and urban mixed region was that women who were the first to work in the manufacturing sector faced substantial levels of high workplace sexual harassment because they'd entered a workspace that had previously employed men only. As one needs assessment respondent said, we faced lots of verbal and sexual harassment because they didn't want women there. So this is an example of what we mean by workplace culture. The men believed the space was theirs and harassment was an effective way for them to protect and claim that space. So I, men I mentioned this because I think that idea of workplace culture is really talked about, but it's somewhere where we can all um, make changes in our workplace so that it works better for everyone. So when it comes to the context, we can see that studies have often shown that sexual harassment operates to protect one person or group's privileges like let's say to a certain role or position or a certain space in the workplace while keeping others away. And that might mean um, you know, your workplace is segregated or only certain people from certain ages, race, or sex take on a certain role in that workplace. So I've mentioned a few examples here, and these are all examples that actually occurred in North America and Canada or, or in America. Um, and they all show that that example of um, space in the workplace and how it's connected to sexual harassment. So the first example was an Afro-Canadian woman who was sexually harassed by both white male and female coworkers in order to get the unspoken expectation that she should know her place in the workplace. And in this situation, this woman experienced um, you know, things like exposure to racialized and sexualized pornography. 
the middle example is about a young man who worked on an oil rig offshore. It was an all-male community. In an environment, he was deemed to be uh, smaller and not masculine enough and faced sexual harassment and an attempted sexual assault. And of course, the third example is one that's had more prevalence in the media as late. And this is about sexual harassment in the Canadian forces. And in a study of 31 women in the combat arms, which was a um, component of the Canadian forces that uh, introduced women into it probably the most recently, that women experienced sexualized harassment, as well as messages of non-acceptance and inconsistent performance standards. Another historical example is what happened um, in 1969. Uh, this is at the New Left counter inaugural, inaugural to Richard Nixon's first inauguration. And it's an interesting historical example, but uh, to me it gives a lot of explanation about how sexual harassment can be used to segregate spaces between, let's say, men and women, or uh, people of different ages, um, and, and other communities that have different social locations. And in this example, um, I learned the story actually when I went to see the movie, She's Beautiful When She's Angry. It's a documentary on the women's movement in North America. And if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. In this example, the New Left Gathering, many hundreds of activists had gathered, and a group of women's advocates asked to speak on the stage. And then anti-war leader Dave Dillinger was serving as Masters of Ceremonies, and he allowed um, Marilyn Webb, a local feminist, to come up to speak. Interestingly, here are a few quotes from the women that attended that day about what happened. As Marilyn began to speak, lots of insults were hurled at her and they're specifically sexualized. So men in the audience began to shout, take her off the stage and F her. These comments do not reflect, of course, any sort of sexual desire or interest in Marilyn, yet they reflect themes and insults and threats. In this example, it's clear how in harassment, be it physical, verbal, or otherwise, can be used to lay claim or protect space and to push others out. So in this context and story, sexually violent words and actions are used to offend or aggressively push others out of a space. And it's a way also of saying, you don't belong here. And if you stay, this is what could happen to you. I wanted to highlight, too, that there's a number of different uh, communities that are um, impacted by sexual harassment and that builds on the information I've already shared. So we can see that young women from marginalized racial, sexual, and socioeconomic groups are more vulnerable to being targeted. There's higher prevalence of sexual harassment for women in military organizations. And oftentimes, targeted persons don't share information because they see themselves as vulnerable even before the harassment occurs and even more so afterwards. I want to share a few tips on taking leadership at work, so fostering that positive workplace culture, and as well as touch a little bit about sexual harassment policies. There's different ways you can foster a positive workplace environment. You can do this preventatively even before there's any kind of incident or concern specifically about sexual harassment in your workplace. I believe a policy is one part of what you can do to address or prevent sexual harassment. But, for example, if those in your workplace or space receive a clear message that everyone belongs, it supports a larger culture where workplace sexual harassment is clearly unwelcome. So at this point, you'll see. First of all, you can recognize that jokes, emails, or banter about women, LGBTQ community, racialized groups are just as damaging to space as are physical and sexualized behaviors. And that's why it's important to recognize things like jokes, emails, and banter in your office or other workspace uh, have a role to play. And of course, foster the direct inclusion of different groups, so including women, LGBTQ folks, diverse workers, and volunteers at your workplace. A few comments on policy. If you do have a policy, is your policy visible to the people who work there? Do they know where to find it? Is it easy to understand? If your policy is impossible to find, or you have to ask a lot of people to find it, it's possible that no one's using it. Also, it should be clear about how to report, who's going to hear that report, where that information goes, and what the possible outcomes may be. And that's because a lot of people who've experienced workplace sexual harassment want to know transparently what could happen in the workplace, 
before I decide to go down that road. So a good policy will not only help those who report, but in addition, help those who are actually considering reporting as well. Also, you want to ask yourself if your policy is effective, and how do you know if it's effective? How do you know if it's stressful to use or if it fails to hold people accountable? What we suggest is to commit to reviewing that policy every three years. Your review process ought to include, um, for example, thoughts and comments from diverse people who you work with. So, for example, you may bring together people from different departments or a team of female employees or a team of LGBTQ identified employees. These are just a few examples and have them walk through that policy and share their thoughts on whether or not they'd actually use it and make recommendations for what would work better for them. Now I'm going to hand things over to my colleague, Julie, to talk about drawing a line in workplace sexual harassment and some practical tips on bystander intervention as well as supporting survivors better. Hi, everybody. So Nicole and I are in two different cities, so we're using two different tech. So if at any point I cut out or you can't hear me, please um, say so in the chat, and I'll try and do what I can to accommodate and fix it. So I'm going to spend the next few minutes chatting a bit about some other ways that you can create a safe work environment. So it's important to have policies. It's important to have them posted and for people to know what their rights are in the workplace. But there's also really practical ways that you can engage your entire culture to really just be the kind of work environment where people feel safe enough to come forward um, and feel empowered enough to speak out if they see something happen. So one of the scenarios for the Draw the Line campaign, draw-the-line.ca, um, we're a provincially funded for part of Ontario's Sexual Violence Action Plan. And since 2011-2012, I've had the real honor of traveling across this province and talking to folks about a whole variety of different forms of sexual violence. And what we do is we just ask people questions. So our question about workplace sexual harassment is this. You hear your boss tell a coworker how great her legs look in a skirt. Do you go back to your desk? And this question is very, very interesting. For the first year or two that we had our site, our website, you had to actually vote on the website in order to get deeper into it. You had to vote on a scenario. And for the, the two years that we had this scenario up on our site with voting, it was always at about 50-50. It was actually the only scenario that had such a close um, ratio of people who would do something and people who wouldn't. And when we workshopped it and we talked to people about why that is, they, they gave us a whole host of reasons, which we'll get into. So I just want you to sort of think about, take a second and think about this scenario, because this is actually far more likely to be what you're going to see uh, than the really sort of stereotypical stuff that I think we were well-intentioned at one point in, you know, the, the 70s and 80s when we really talked about workplace sexual harassment. But as Nicole said, I think the unfortunate part of that is that it really sort of perpetuated this idea that it's going to be very overt, very explicit, very easy to identify. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it looks like this. And in large part, it's because people oftentimes are testing the waters. They're trying to see the threshold of what is and is not tolerated in the workplace. And so that's why it's really important to take everything very, very seriously, because what happens is that if you don't, then that person gets the message of, oh, okay, this is okay, I can get away with that, and then they keep pushing the boundary. And that's what we know about sexual violence more broadly, that it's a crime of escalation. But in particular, when it comes to workplace sexual harassment, um, and you can see the work dynamics here as well. It's very specific. It's not, hey, I think you look really great today, which even that can make people uncomfortable, but that it's very specific to your legs in that skirt. There's also the power dynamic of a person with seniority and authority in the workplace versus someone who doesn't have the same level of authority. So all those dynamics need to be, you should sort of be aware of that. And the reason why most people don't intervene is because of this delicious little phenomenon called the bystander effect. The bystander effect has been observed in all kinds of emergency situations and in fact was first observed in the medical community. So that stereotype that, that many of us have heard the story of, you know, you're more likely to die of a heart attack in a crowded room. So that's really where it sort of came from. And it comes from this idea that the bystander effect is, occurs when the presence of others actually hinders an individual from intervening in an emergency situation. And usually it's because one of two things goes through their mind. So one, I don't have to do anything because someone else will. Or two, 
no one else did anything, so why should I bother? And what's really important to remember here is to think about those two pieces in the context of the victim. So if I'm the person who's been victimized and I look around me and people saw or people heard about it and they did nothing, then you can see why people don't bother reporting. It's actually it's full on witnesses to what I experienced didn't come to my defense. How the heck would I be believed if I went out and told my employer later on or I told someone who wasn't even there and tried to get them to believe me? And then secondly, um, look at it from the perspective of the perpetrator. I look around, people saw what happened, maybe they heard about it after the fact, people didn't do anything, and then I think, oh, okay, well this is, this is behavior that's accepted in this workplace. So it's really, really important to think of those two pieces in the context of the different perspectives, because then that shows you, okay, this is why people don't report, and this is why this stuff is repeated behavior. So, these are some of the reasons that I've heard when I've workshopped this scenario, and I want to be clear that I've, I've worked with very, very diverse folks over the past four years of working on this project, everything from very, very rural um, sixth graders to people in nursing homes to campuses to military bases to I even um, brought this conversation to Parliament Hill after what happened on Parliament Hill and, and some parliamentarians and staffers invited me to come and speak. This is a wide, wide variety of people and a wide variety of different workplaces who said these kinds of things. So um, if you work in, a, in a, a workspace where you don't have access to YouTube, unfortunately you're going to have to just sort of um, sit tight for the next two, two minutes, two and a half minutes, um, because we're going to play a short clip that we created that will actually show you narrative where both victims and bystanders talk about the awkwardness, the complexity, and uh, the fears of coming forward to talk about workplace sexual harassment. So we're going to wait for that to load. Um, but if you don't have access to YouTube, I apologize. Um, but stay with us because we're going to come right back.
Great. So, um, some folks think my volume was too loud earlier and that it was too low, so I'm just going to turn it up, and I apologize if I'm now screaming in your eardrums, <laughs> but it sounds like some folks couldn't hear me. So, so those of you who couldn't see the video, just a brief overview for a series of women, both who are victims and bystanders, talking about the complexity of the issue in the workplace and really the idea of, did I really see what I thought I saw? And my gut tells me it wasn't okay, but he's worked here longer than I have, or maybe she was into it, and maybe I misheard. And that's really what I have heard working with folks over the past four years. So a big one is, I don't want it to come back on me. So the fear of retribution is real, and particularly in the workplace where you have to work with these people every single day. It's not the same as when we're dealing with street harassment and you're telling someone to just tell off a guy who's being creepy at a bus stop. I'm never going to see him again. This is someone that I'm going to work with who will find out, presumably, that I said something or who will deduct who said something, and then he's going to come after me, or other people are not going to trust me because they're going to think I'm a snitch. All of this stuff um, is real, and, and it's a valid fear, I think. Two, maybe I misheard. Maybe that's not what I heard, or maybe I saw, or maybe I'm just reading too much into it, or maybe I'm too hypersensitive, or maybe I'm too PC, the term of being PC. This is such an awful term, um, but that's really pervasive as well. Three, I know him. He's kidding. He's just like that. Like, yeah, oftentimes, it's, too, it's also written off as an age thing. So I've heard a lot of people say, oh, well, older men in the office, they just don't know how we are nowadays. And, you know, they're just kind of old guys who don't really get it. So, you know, it's not threatening. Uh, four, he has more seniority than me or the person who's the perpetrator uh, has more authority than you, and so there's a fear of, am I going to be pushed out of my job? And then lastly, but also equally as importantly, um, and where we can come in and where we can really solve this problem and this question is people who just don't know what to do. People who are just, yeah, they're just, like I see it and then I think, ah, you know, like I know it's not okay or maybe I didn't say something and then I went home and it kind of ate away at me. And then, like, I need to say something, but now I feel like it's too late. So that's really what we're going to move into now is um, looking at the concrete ways that you can make a difference if you're witnessing this stuff in the workplace. So firstly, always being aware of your own, where you're situated in the workplace, your own level of comfort, and even just personalities. I mean, there are some folks, clearly myself being one of them, who's very unabashed, who feels, you know, entitled to say things and um, but that's me, and that's also my personality, and that's also the fact that I have the resources and I've done this work long enough that I, I'm well versed in these issues. But maybe you're not. So if you are, um, if you have a relationship with the folks involved and you feel like you can say something in that moment, go for it. Uh, as Nicole said, if it's something like a female forward, so many people talk about that, especially lately, I feel like I've heard that more and more, where someone circulates a sexist, transphobic, racist, ableist, just really gross kind of email forwards in the workplace, you can just reply all and say, you know, this is really inappropriate, I think this is gross, please don't send this to us, that kind of piece. Um, but if you don't feel comfortable doing that or you want to do it in tandem to something else, uh, getting backup is really, really important. So, you know, if your workplace is very, very small and you don't have a human resources officer, if you, you know, maybe it's your union rep, or maybe it's even just other colleagues and kind of talking with other colleagues and saying, look, I, I saw this thing, and it just felt really off, and it hasn't, hasn't sat well with me. Can we maybe brainstorm some things that we can do? Um, and then, you know, if you have a human resources officer or someone who you can take that complaint to, very, very important. Um, going back to what Nicole said, know what your policy is, follow through on it. If there's a protocol in the workplace, do that. Uh, if you feel like HR doesn't have your back or maybe that you don't, feel supported by them or they're just ill-equipped. Um, also, if you're, if you're a unionized workplace, you have a union ramp, you have someone on your floor, you have someone in your space um, who, you know, through the collective agreement should be able to support you through that. But never underestimate the power of just connecting with colleagues as well. Just having a chat with other folks that you trust at work, one or two people, and just kind of bounce ideas off of them. But the biggest thing, the thing that I think if you remember nothing else, from uh, from this portion, and the piece that I really want people to just kind of spread this thing like wildfire, is when you see something that's shady, that's inappropriate, that just makes you feel off, the best thing you can do, the easiest thing you can do, and the least confrontational thing that you can do, 
is just to check in with the person who's been targeted. So everything from street harassment to someone who looks not okay at a party to someone who just witnessed a comment or was the target of a comment at work, you just check in with them. It doesn't have to be right that second. You maybe sort of pull them aside at lunch or go by their cubicle or send them a quick email and say, hey, do you have a second to chat? And you just you just explain your discomfort to them and say, I, w I saw him say that to you. Maybe they laughed about it, but then you think, okay, well, maybe they laughed about it because they were into it, but maybe they laughed because they were just really uncomfortable and trying to get the hell out of that situation. So you just check in with them and say, I saw this. I heard this happen, whatever the case may be. Are you okay? Is everything all right? Do you need to talk to someone? I thought it seemed kind of shady. I just want to check in with you and just kind of let you know, like give you the space. And then if she says, oh my gosh, no. It's like this inside joke. You know, him and I had this thing going back and forth. It's not a big deal. Or actually didn't make me uncomfortable, whatever. Then, okay, great. I just thought I'd check in. But if in the highly likely case that they were not comfortable with that comment, that they are feeling really vulnerable and very targeted, then you've just given them an open door for them to talk about it. And maybe it's not in that moment. Maybe they're so thrown off or maybe they don't want to think about it or maybe they have a meeting to go to or, or whatever. But you've now just made it known that you're someone at work that they can trust, that you're someone at work who has their back, that when and if they feel comfortable talking about it, that you're going to have their back. And I really can't emphasize enough how important that is. And it really makes a difference to change whether or not someone seeks self-support, whether or not someone feels comfortable filing an official complaint. It really, 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 truly makes a difference. And even if it happens after the fact, it's still important. So in my work with Hollaback, looking at street harassment, for example, we talk about different ways of intervening. One of them is waiting until the moment has passed if, it's, if it feels too unsafe to intervene in that moment and to just check in with them after the fact. And sometimes we, we get feedback from people saying, well, what is that going to do? Like, he already harassed her. I didn't stop it from harassing her. I didn't stop him from harassing her. But then when you actually speak to women who've had that experience, they'll tell you, oh, it made a world of difference. It made it feel like I was seen. It made me feel like I wasn't, quote, unquote, crazy for being upset by it. It made me feel validated that, yeah, OK, I'm not wrong for being upset by this. This was not OK. It's so, so critical, and it really breaks people's fear of like, oh, but maybe I misheard, or I don't want to make it awkward. You check in with them, and then you give them the space to take the direction. And if they say, no, 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 I'm all good, then they're all good. And no harm, no foul, you didn't make anything awkward, but you opened up a door, which is really, really important. Now, let's say you checked in with that person, and they said, yeah, actually, I'm super uncomfortable, and this is not the first time. Or maybe someone just full-on discloses to you. So maybe someone pulls you aside at lunch, asks to go for a coffee, sits in your office, whether it's because they, you're their, you know, have seniority over them and they report to you, or maybe it's just because you're a colleague and you're a good friend and they just feel comfortable sharing that with you because they feel like you're going to believe them. Here's some really, really important stuff to remember, key, key things to remember when it comes to supporting someone who's disclosed. First and foremost, believe and validate. So, so, so important. Supporting survivors of sexual violence is a skill set and it's an expertise. But as someone who's been doing this work for quite some time, I can tell you that the vast majority of what I do when I work with survivors is I validate and I listen. Because we live in a culture that tells you that when women make these kinds of complaints, that they're looking for attention, they're trying to take a good man down. Like Nicole said, there's a lot of elements to Jean Gomeshi's story, but oftentimes we forget that it started as a workplace sexual harassment issue, and people who worked around him were harassed by him but were afraid to say something because he was such a big deal. So I think it's really important to remember that people don't make these complaints willy-nilly. People know that there's going to create heat in the office, that there's going to be tension. Um, you know, people say these things because they happened and they're real. So, so that's really, really important, and to also recognize that people are going to come in feeling like they're not going to believe them. So it's really important to just right away name it. I believe you. I'm sorry this is happening. Um, and just listen attentively and let them dictate what they're looking for. Confidentiality is so important. All survivors of sexual violence, regardless of what the context is, fear that their story will be spread around like wildfire. So it's really important that if you have a protocol that dictates the second you hear something, you have to report it. 
then you need to tell them that right away. You need to let them know, even if it means literally interrupting them and saying, I'm sorry, but I just want to let you know that if you tell me that you're experiencing something, I have to write it down, I have to make a formal report. Yes, that might mean that person doesn't feel comfortable reporting anymore, but it also means that that person knows that when they do feel comfortable reporting, they know where that information is going to go. So it's a very, very delicate balance between respecting your own protocols and procedures and respecting survivors, but it's really, really important. And it's the same thing when I work with youth. I make it clear, I'm here to listen to you, but if you are under a certain age, I have a duty to report. So know that before you say something so that you don't feel like I didn't actually respect your confidentiality. And when I said it stayed with me, I actually should have told you there's a caveat to where I have to disclose to others. Also important is offering resources and support and not advice. So advice for us in this context looks like you should or you must or if you don't, what if he does it to other people. All of those, that kind of language is really disempowering. And what's really, really important to know about sexual violence, unlike other forms of violence, is that it's 100% about power and control. So when someone has been sexually assaulted or is being sexually harassed, they're having their power stripped away from them. And the second that you take over and act as though they don't know what's best for them and they can't make decisions for themselves, you're reinforcing that power dynamic that says that they are weak um, and that they have no power. So it's really, really important for them to be informed about all their options, which includes you can make a formal report, you don't have to make a formal report, whatever your policy looks like, um, and that you really put it on them as the expert in their own lives and the one who has to live with this. At the end of the day, you can walk away from it, but they have to live like that every single day. So it's important for them to have some level of control. And then lastly, supporting others means supporting yourself. It can be really, really tough to hear disclosures if the person is disclosing about a friend of yours, for example, and there's that realization of, oh my god, but I work with, I've worked with Mike for 20 years and I, I just thought he was such a good person and now I hear that he's doing this to her. It can be really, really difficult to really process that information. Maybe you're a survivor yourself and they're telling you this and it's bringing up your own feelings. Or maybe you have also been sexually harassed in this workplace and you had decided you would never say anything and now someone's opening up that sort of a can of worms for you. So it's important to get your own support, whether that's outside of the workplace, your local sexual assault center, um, whatever that looks like. You have a right to seek your own support if you're dealing with sexual harassment in the workplace and, and you're struggling. And so um, I'm just going to end with uh, some of the resources before we launch into the questions. I'm just going to leave this screen up for you before we do the Q&A. Um, just to let you know if you're looking for further resources on this kind of stuff, the Learning Network, so many great resources, online learning modules that are super easy to do. You can do them in your office on your own. Um, the Draw the Line campaign, we're a free bilingual campaign. So if you work in a bilingual workplace, it's Tracent les Unites. Um, same thing, Tracent les Unites um, All of our resources are free. Literally, you can order 500 of the postcards that I just showed you, 500 posters. Um, we have that great video. All of it's up on our website. And then you can also have myself or another um, person in your community come and actually do a facilitated uh, workshop and discussion with your workplace or with the youth in your community, whatever that looks like for you. So um, I'm just going to pass them, I think it's over to Elsa. Yeah, and look, it's exactly 1045. Aren't we good? Um, <laughs> so I'm going to pass the microphone over um, for the Q&A section. Hi there, sorry for the pause. It's Nicole, and I just thought I'd... Can people hear me? I'm just checking in to make sure people hear me. Um, we just want to invite people to use the chat box in order to ask some questions. And uh, I just want to take another moment, too, just to follow up on uh, some of the resources Julie had walked us through. The Draw the Line campaign, and as well the Responding to Sexual Violence Disclosures, while it does have a number of different sexual violence scenarios, has quite a few that reference complex situations of sexual harassment, including workplace sexual harassment. And the video um, components that are a piece of these learning modules also help people to get a sense of what are helpful um, responses to a disclosure, as well as less helpful responses to disclosures. 
Um, I did mention at the beginning too that we have not talked too much today about this, uh, responding uh, in terms of the legal and human rights commission pieces. If you're looking to know more about the particulars about these reporting bodies and how to access them, um, there is a learning network brief from May 2015 that has a lot of details about reporting, formal reporting processes and how to access them. Um, so I just want to take a few moments, I'm not seeing any questions in the, the, the chat so far for us. Um, so I guess I just, I'll just give it a minute, if you have a question, feel free to uh, type it on in there and Julie and I will, will take it on. While we're taking a moment to do that, um, as Linda mentioned in the beginning, this uh, webinar in its entirety will be posted on the Learning Network uh, website following the webinar itself. A lot of the um, academic sources as well as community-based resources that were referenced throughout this uh, webinar um, are also available here on our references page. And also, of course, if you wish to check in with Julie or myself, Nicole, um, you can find our contact information through the Learning Network or here's our websites. One is the Ontario Coalition of Rape Crisis Centers at sexualassaultsupport.ca and the other one is the Draw the Line campaign, www.drawtheline.ca. And um, those, those you, can, you can access some of the resources as well here and learn how to get in touch with us if there's a question that uh, we were not able to get to. So I have a question here, um, and, and I'll just read it out, and I just wondered, uh, Julie, maybe you can, you can begin with it and I can add in as well, and the, the comment says, can you please comment on the complexity of managing sexual harassment uh, incidences when the perpetrator and the victim are both part of a bargaining unit? Yeah, so, yeah. It, is complex <laughs> um, and I think it's, it's important to really come back to what we would refer to as sort of feminist principles of support which is giving the, the survivor um, and the person who the accused I suppose would be the language that would be used um, the space to know what their full range of options are um, and that beyond a formal complaint people are entitled to support and I think that's a real game changer that we don't really refer to often um, is that just offering people support outside of the community beyond your union, beyond the HR. Uh, and I'm sure Nicole can speak to this as well, but in all the years I've been doing frontline support work, it's, it's really staggering to me how people think their only options when it comes to anything related to sexual violence is going to the police or going to the hospital. Um, and when it comes to workplace sexual harassment, people think I make a complaint with HR or I, I have no, that's, like, that's my only option, which is not true, right? Like, people are entitled to uh, support, mental health support, they're entitled to um, EAP, so employment, uh, employment assistance programs depending on the workplace, they're entitled to going to their local sexual assault center, right? Um, and those are options that can be presented to people that is not taking sides, that is not um, pitting people against each other that is not violating what you're mandated to do in the workplace. It's just sort of letting people know, obviously, you're struggling and I want to let you know that outside of this particular process that we have to go through, um, you're entitled to support that it's completely outside and beyond this workplace. So if you feel more comfortable um, going there to figure out what your options are, you're absolutely entitled to doing that. But certainly it's very, very, very complex when you're dealing with people who are under the same um, contract, who have the same collective agreement, um, who work in close proximity to each other, who are partners on a project. Like there's all kinds of layers to the workplace sexual harassment issue that it's not easy. It's definitely not easy and I want to say that we get that. Um, and that's why there are folks to help you sort of navigate that as well. So that includes if you're the employer and you're, you're struggling with what do I do or you're the union rep and you're struggling with what to do, you can reach out to folks like um, the Ontario Coalition um, to really kind of figure out what your options are. Thanks, Julie, for this. And um, we have 
another question here too, and the the contact is also saying that they're having some issues with accessibility, and I wanted to clarify that there will be a typed transcript um, as well as a recording of this entire webinar um, available afterwards. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry I won't be able to type back in, in response, but I want to pose a question to Julie um, and I'll add in as well too. And, um, and we hope that those of you listening can hear the responses and then the transcript will be available to everyone uh, beyond that. So the question is, uh, what can we do when we don't have HR or any reps? The issue of harassment might be present, but we have, and we have a policy, but we feel like there's nowhere to report. And the second piece is, also, what can we do to raise awareness when managers or male staff are not present, present or participating in information sessions like these? So if you don't have someone to report to directly, I think it's important to go back to do you have a policy because workplaces have to have a policy. Um, and so I think it's important then to go back and think, okay, well, if we don't have a formal capacity or a formal representative to, have to bring our complaints to, how can we create you know, create a formal one or create an informal network of people and make it known that, you know, we have taken training through the learning network, we have um, reviewed the policy, we've established, we've put up posters, so you know, who, like really just sort of naming some folks in, in your workplace who can take on that role in a sort of unofficial capacity because you have to have some level of policy uh, in your workplace and so I think it's, you can sort of create that in an informal way uh, and people will know that. They'll know, okay, this is, like, Julie's the person that I work with who, um, she's really great and she gets what's going on, um, and I know that she gets the stuff. So I, I'm going to talk to her about my, my issue that I'm dealing with, and I'm going to talk to her about what my options are. So there's really nothing stopping folks from creating that in an informal way, and even if it's just letting people know, oh, hey, I just know I participated in this thing, and this is something I'm really interested in, and, um, you know, you put a poster up in your cube or your station, and you just kind of um, do it in an informal basis. Um, and the second question uh, is one I get all the time, which is the people who need to be here are never the ones who are here. <laughs> so I think um, some really great opportunities and things I've heard about in the past with other workplaces where they're struggling with that particular issue is putting up a poster, for example. So I once did a, a drug the line on workplace sexual harassment workshop in person where someone took a huge stack of our postcards and a couple posters and they put them up in the lunchroom of their workplace. And they put the stack of postcards there and they came back the next day and they were all gone. And they thought, oh no, someone pitched them in the garbage. But then they walked around and saw that multiple women had put the postcard on their workstation. And it turns out there was a man who had been harassing women in the workplace and women saw it as a really kind of subtle, non-confrontational way of making it known that they were aware this was happening and they weren't okay with it. So I think that's a great thing that people can do as well is put up the posters, put up some postcards, and then have a lunch and learn. Um, have multiple lunch and learns so it doesn't look as though you're sort of um, clearly targeting workplace sexual harassment, but that's also been a really great way to do things is have a speaker come in over lunch, um, even in a really kind of relaxed, casual way of just kind of starting the conversation. Bystander intervention is a great way to get people talking about this in a way that's not confrontational and it doesn't make um, men in particular very defensive because you're not saying, don't do this to women. You're kind of coming at it sideways and saying, hey, if you saw someone do this to someone, first of all, that's not okay. And secondly, what are you going to do about it in your capacity? So those are some sort of gentle, subtle ways that people can integrate this content into their work environment if they feel like either of the management or the men who really need to, to hear it aren't showing up, um, you can still kind of bring that content to them. And so once again, I would say connecting with us through Draw the Line or with the Learning Network, um, with Nicole through the Coalition to see, uh, to bring in a speaker or to bring in um, some content in that way. And then pass it over to you, Monica. Uh, thanks so much, Julie. And I thought I'd add, too, it just points to the complexity of this work where um, when you're dealing with sexual harassment in your workplace, that also means that there's implications on somebody who's raising these issues. So the idea of informal ways of bringing it up or asking for policy review 
or having a, a group of your team get together just to talk about related issues might be a good way to broker the subject. And the next question we have, and I guess this will be our last one, we've just got a few minutes here, is um, what can you do if the consequence of blowing the whistle of blowing the whistle comes back on you, and are there resources available for that? Yes, absolutely. So um, I actually uh, just did another workplace sexual harassment conversation this week um, with some women, in, um, including Christine Whitecross who's the head of dealing with sexual violence in the Canadian military. And so we talked about this at length because this is, as I said, the number one thing people hear is, I don't want it to come back on me. And one woman spoke really passionately about her experience of four years of arbitration in her federal workplace, where she said, by the end, I felt like a battered woman because I was so worn down um, and so isolated in my workplace. So that is, it is real and it is a problem. Um, and I think that's why, one, bystander intervention is so important. And we think of it as intervening in that sense. But I also think it's also just having each other's backs when someone makes a complaint. And really educating the workplace on when someone makes a complaint, they're not trying to take a good man down. They're experiencing something and they want to talk about it and they want it to stop. Um, and so rallying around people who have made a complaint is so important because isolation Regardless of what the form of violence is, isolation is what wears people down. Um, and so I think it's really, really important to engage all of your workplace as a prevention tool in saying, this is not only something that's not tolerated, but we're going to support people who come forward. And we're going to believe you. And if someone is coming forward, we're going to make sure they have access to support. So things like their local sexual assault center, for example, and that they have an advocate, that they have someone that they can talk to, they have a space to debrief. Because what we know, and I have heard it from multiple women, multiple women, is I know I can't get fired for making a complaint, but I also know that they can make this environment so toxic that I choose to exit. And we need to address that. That is the number one thing I hear from women as to why they didn't come forward or, quite frankly, why they regret ever saying anything in the first place. But I think once we link it to the bison intervention conversation and why are we all rallying around the person who's been accused or the perpetrator instead of rallying in support um, of the woman or women who made a complaint and having that as a preventative conversation I think is really, really important. And then bringing in your community partners, people outside of the workplace to ensure that whoever is making a complaint has an ally who works outside of there whose only job is to support the person who's been victimized, who doesn't feel a conflict um, and who literally is only representing them and their interests. Um, I, I would agree as well, too, and I know we often think about a uh, sense of justice when violence happens, particularly in the workplace environment, that um, that winning a case or, or having, you know, having somebody who's doing something offensive get let go are the only ways to win, but in fact what we often hear from survivors is support from their colleagues is the one thing that made the biggest difference. I know we're going to have to wrap up. I'm so sorry for those of you who might have had questions that didn't get posed today. So I remind you again that all these resources will be available on the Learning Network website. Thanks so much to Julie and to all of you that participated on behalf of the Learning Network. Um, also, please click on the link in the chat box so that you can complete the evaluation associated with today's webinar. It'll totally take you about one or two minutes. So on behalf of Ontario Coalition of Rape Crisis Centers and the Learning Network, Thanks so much for participating today.